An insignificant blip on a satellite photo taken June 18, 1972. Look up over Pennsylvania, Mike. Look at these clouds dumping a good bit of rain, enough rain to nearly saturate the ground. But few in these parts paid much attention to the storm called Agnes. Mary Lou Tobias of Suarezville said she certainly didn't. That week before, it just poured and poured and poured. Mm -hmm. I mean, you just didn't think, you know, that anything like this was going to happen. June 19, Agnes hits land in Florida. The rain clouds are departing Pennsylvania. The sun comes out a bit, but the ground is saturated. John Tobias remembers it as a most usual week. Just uh, doing uh, what uh, we I normally do because before. of the bad weather. We didn't do, no there was nothing to do. The photo of that day, June 19th, picks up a blob of clouds over the Midwest. We, going about our daily routines, couldn't know circumstance was about to change our lives. The 21st was our wedding anniversary, our 14th wedding anniversary. Agnes did not simply pass over and go out to the North Atlantic to die. The storm system from the West moved in, absorbed it, gave it new life. A pattern of air currents made Agnes stay. So that you had the effect of Agnes looping over Pennsylvania and meandering and stalling because it merged with this upper air low that was coming in. And so it rained and rained, and there was no place for it all to go except into streams and then to rivers. Overhead, the clouds boiled in the sky, turning daylight into twilight. And we began to ask each other, when will it stop? There's too much rain, we said. Still, few of us gave little more thought to it than that. Mary Lou and John, their two sons, 11 and a half and 13, were doing what everyone does. Just going about doing the normal, normal everyday things. But the stage was set, and as it turned out, nothing we could have done would have prevented what was about to happen. On the afternoon of the 22nd, the Susquehanna was pushing at the dikes that held it in check, a raging bull of a river ready to run. When it did, the results were more horrible than any of us could imagine. I just couldn't believe it was going to happen. I just couldn't believe that when they says we had to leave uh, the house because of the water was going to, uh, we were going to be flooded, I just didn't believe it. I just couldn't believe it was going to happen. I'm Mike Stevens, Newswatch 16, on the Pennsylvania Road. No one living in Wilkesbury that Friday in June will ever forget it. We had almost nothing but rain the two weeks prior to the flood. The ground had already soaked up two inches of rain, leaving little room for more. But now, the rain that had fallen in New York State was about to overcome us. We had sirens running up and down the avenue. It was like a madhouse that day. And that was just before the dike went out and life would never be the same. The sandbagging efforts came to a halt. Downtown Wilkesbury and Kingston could barely be seen after the Susquehanna overflowed its banks. Boats and canoes took the place of cars and buses. Thousands living in the communities bordering the river were sent running for higher ground, not knowing when it would be safe to return or what they'd return to. Bob McKeon got out his Super 8 camera and started to chronicle what he saw. We talked to him at Hollenbach Park, which became a huge lake during the flood. This area down here is where you've seen all the water. This was a lake for days and months. Almost a month there was a lake here. You had good fishing here, too, if you wanted to. It was carp, everything down in this pond. Not many in the mood to fish. The flood more likely washed away their fishing poles and a piece of the American dream. Their homes and, in some cases, jobs temporarily. In Fortyfort, the flood not only took its toll on the living, but on the dead. Some caskets and bodies washed in all directions, leaving the loved ones wondering if they'd ever be returned to their rightful places. Once the waters had receded, a blanket of mud remained. Mud that turned to dust, a constant reminder of how quickly things can change. It was like a, a ghost town in the morning. Everything was quiet. No buses, no cars running, no lights, no nothing. Everything was quiet. Quiet in the cities, but there was life outside of it. There were a number of evacuation centers, rooms filled with army cots, and families with just the clothes on their backs. Pocono Downs was a, an emergency hospital set up there. It was, I forget how many beds they put in there, and they kept the sick there. 
Well, they were mostly all flood victims at that time. People uh -huh. who maybe drank the water and got sick and people who were running around too much and got overcome. Who wouldn't be overcome by this sight? Homes rocked off their foundations. Cars moved into piles by the floodwaters as if they were tinker toys. Families forced to start all over again. And if you were old enough to walk or talk 20 years ago, this seems like yesterday. A place to go to, you didn't know how long you were going to live like this. And it, it was just something you couldn't think of. People in Danville and Bloomsburg recall the panic. They recall the fear and the horror. They remember how the sirens shattered their sound sleep in the middle of the night. When some people got out of bed, they put their feet right in water. When you get a swift current, you can't stand up on it. It's really scary. This is what the lower end of Bloomsburg looked like in June of 1972. The water in Fishing Creek backed up because the river was so high. As much as 12 feet of water flooded the McGee Carpet Mill, dozens of homes, and the Bloomsburg Fairgrounds. We got to this corner right here, and the water was running right down this street. Police Chief Butch Lee talks about Danville's nightmare with the Agnes Flood. The borough has dozens of photographs. And there's the high school. The two streams that go right through Danville swelled over its banks. So did the Susquehanna River. All the roads leading into town were covered with water or debris. Trailers toppled. Continental Boulevard collapsed. The Montour Street Bridge washed away. Motorboats rescued hundreds of stranded families. High water ruined stores on Danville's main street. This is the second ward of Danville, perhaps the hardest hit area of town during the 72 flood. Where I'm standing, the water was probably about this deep. My family was on summer vacation in 1972 in June, but when we came back, we remember going through this part of town, and I remember seeing water lines in everybody's homes and mud all over the place. And what was most upsetting is to see people's belongings out in front of their home, destroyed. And the smell? You could smell the river everywhere. Donna Navrocki swears creek silt still seeps out of the walls of her home when she washes it. Maurice, nobody will ever, ever tell me that that wasn't an act of God. It really did. It, it was so bad that my, when my sister and I walked in here, all we did was sit and cry. I mean, really, literally cry. We had nothing left. And you just can't really absorb it. I mean, you walk in, and your whole house, everything, you walk in, it's just covered with a foot of mud, debris, smell, oil, grease. Uh, the furniture's all ruined. Yep. I'm five foot two. Yep. So we're talking at least five was, foot six. It was over my head. Yep. <laughs> or just about, anyway. So. Former Mayor Dan Bowman took these home movies of the Bloomsburg Fairgrounds. A lot of damage, it was a lot of damage to the buildings, but we managed with a lot of hard work and a lot of teamwork to put it all back together, and we had a fair in 1972, and it was a good one. But so many people in the Danville-Bloomsburg area lost belongings, they spent a lifetime saving. There was mental anguish for a long, long time. And I think that's probably the greatest disaster, even greater than the flood. Flood victims received food and clothing from all over Pennsylvania, so they learned the meaning of generosity. But they also learned the meaning of respect, respect for the unpredictability of storms like Agnes. If you have rain, and they're going to say it's going to rain for two or three days, there is nobody that's gone through that flood that doesn't think the same thing. It just, it just never leaves your mind. Never. Marisa Burke, Newswatch 16. There was a war fought the night of the 22nd, the morning of the 23rd, it was a series of battles fought with shovels and sandbags against an enemy that did not know the meaning of the word defeat. They all tried valiantly in those hours in June 20 years ago to stop the Susquehanna, but in the end, the river was victorious, and it marched into Wyoming Valley. They told us to all to go over to the Holy Trinity School. Uh, I took Mary Lou and the two boys over there and the dogs and then I went down to the hose company on Shoemaker Street mm -hmm. to load sandbags and haul them down to the river. John Tobias of Suarezville, he joined the battle being waged against the river about 6.30 on the morning of the 23rd. Up and down the river, skirmishes were being waged, but none really were being won. 
The river had the upper hand, and it kept winning and winning and winning, until finally there was no more ground to give, and we had no choice but to surrender. This is an old railroad bed that was sort of a dam against the water coming in from the river a mile or so to our left. John's house was over to the right. Back then, all this was open. Few houses surrounded his. He and Mary Lou came back from the evacuation center to pick up a few things. As he and his wife hurried back and forth, John looked out his window at this point along the tracks. That's when I saw the water coming right through. And, I, and it was coming right over. And to me, that's breaking through then. And I said to my wife, I said, well, let's go. They left, but couldn't get back to the Trinity Church to get their children and the water just kept coming and coming all over now. John said, no, it'll never come over the tracks. Don't worry. Well, uh, when we came back to get the blankets and the canned food and stuff, I, I did, I worried. And then when we couldn't get down, I worried about the children because they were so young. All up and down Wyoming Valley, it was the same. Families separated, rushing to evacuation centers, not knowing what would happen next. And almost everywhere you turned was the muddy brown water. I felt bad about losing the house. And, and, but the, the most terrifying thing was not knowing where the children were. And those kids, all I kept thinking was, I hope they're OK. I hope they're not frightened. I was scared about what's going to happen now. You know, what, what are we going to do? Uh, how long is this going to be? And just how much damage is down there? Yeah. Sure, uh, I, we, we were all scared. A few days later, John and Mary Lou found their kids safe at a relative's home. It took about that long for the water to go down. All the while, though, it swirled about our streets, through our homes and businesses. We could only guess about the damage being done. As it turned out, there was plenty. And in a way, there still is. But that's a story for tomorrow, when we'll look at the aftermath of Agnes. I'm Mike Stevens, Newswatch 16, on the Pennsylvania Road. These signs that show the high water mark in 72 are all throughout Knoebel's groves near Ellisburg. But Ron Knoebel really doesn't need signs to remind him of the water. He remembers the devastation from the Agnes flood like it was yesterday. Both creeks came up. This one came up and, let's say, bled water down this direction, and that one you know, overran its banks down that direction. The two creeks that add serenity and beauty to Knoebel's groves are the same creeks that raged out of control in June of 1972. The fierce current of the water rocked buildings off their foundations, and the mud wrecked most of the rides. The uh, erosion was just dramatic, as there, were, there was water everywhere in the park, uh, anywhere from uh, a foot to nine or ten feet deep, and the water moved through very fast. What did you think when you walked into the park the next day and, and saw it like this? Um, at, at one point later on, I cried just to see it all. If anything is symbolic of Knoebels, it is the carousel that dates back to 1913. This music box type organ is priceless, so you can imagine how difficult it was to see this covered with water, especially the folding paper music that feeds the organ. This was all underwater during the flood. Uh, some of it was lost totally, but other sections of it were rec recovered and uh, uh, dried out, re-glued back together so that it could be uh, used and play the music of the carousels again. Ron Knoebel remembers how someone painstakingly poked mud out of the holes in the sheet music so it could be used again. Knoebel also remembers with emotion what happened right after the water receded. Plumbers, electricians, and grounds crews worked night and day to repair the park. Our employees came back and uh, they, they wanted to get started at repairing it. Uh, uh, but the, the people in the community came back uh, uh, and said, you know, this is our park too, and, and we, uh, uh, we want to help. We come here, we picnic here, we bring our families here, our children have grown up here, 
and we don't want to lose this part of our lives. And uh, uh, people came out and volunteered and helped to uh, uh, clean up and recover from the, from the flood. In just nine days, the park was open for business again. All the rides were fixed except for one. Twenty years later, you'd never know Agnes was so destructive here. But look closely the next time you pass the Playland building. This tree actually stopped the building after it came off its foundation from the strong current of water. The tree in the roof is a reminder of Agnes, but it's the tremendous response from the community that the Knoble family will remember forever. The park used a limerick to advertise its reopening after the flood. It went like this. Knoble's groves had a great flood. Knoble's groves sat in the mud. All the park workers and all the park friends put the groves back together again. Maurice Burke, Newswatch 16, Northumberland County. Our first scene here is of the uh, Huntsville Dam the night before the flood. You can see the dam looks quite a lot like Niagara Falls. At the big center. That's the Agnes Flood, as remembered by George Pyle and captured on his home movies. The flood did not chase George from his home in Dallas. But as an administrator at Westside Votech 20 years ago, George was pulled into one of the biggest challenges of his life, organizing the feeding and clothing of thousands of flood victims on the west side in Luzerne County. Through his own home movies, George and two co-workers, Thomas Feeney and Beatrice Ray, take us back 20 years to the time where they helped the helpless of the Agnes Flood. This is uh, Westside Tech. We had set up a, uh, an emergency medical center here at the school during the flood. We were the first one on the west side to have a full staff uh, physicians and uh, nurses to take care of the medical needs of the uh, patients and flood victims. They brought the baby heat to West Side Tech because it could only be unplugged for less than five minutes. They unplugged it at Nesbitt Hospital, rushed it to West Side Tech, we put it in a nurse's suite, they plugged it back in, and the baby survived. Unfortunately, I don't know the baby's name. Familiar scene, that's how they came out of their homes with the helicopter. Yes. They would land right below the school, as you can see, coming here. These uh, are evacuees coming in now from downtown with their belongings. Some all they have is a pillow. Yes. And this is loads and loads of clothing from where? All from over. all over the United States, well, all over Pennsylvania. In fact, they even used shotguns to bring part of it into us, so they said. The they the were room. afraid it was going to be hijacked. We served 90 people for breakfast. Then we turned right around, served 400 at lunch, and we were up in the thousands by the dinner time. Hmm, there were, what, three or four military units were there, I believe. Yeah, we had the Marines, we had the Army, we had the Air Force. We had Coast Guard. We had Rocky Blyer there from the Pittsburgh Steelers. Oh, I remember. He was called to active duty during the flood. About the third day, I'd say, of the flood, uh, after cleanup had begun. This is the dike area. Pumps. Mm. That would be disheartening coming into their home. That looks like that. Think of all the memories that are gone. Yes. Now, I've had more people tell me they lost and uh, their, their pictures. In fact, I've, I've had a lot of people bring in old movies mm -hmm. that I had to watch, literally. I don't think anyone really knows what we did, except those who passed through. It's nice remembering how important we were. Just three of the heroes worth remembering from that June in 1972. Mary Ravazio, Newswatch 16. It was really a tremendous tragedy. Not just for us, but for the whole, the whole community up and down the river. Everybody was just unbelievable. Big mud. Big bad mud. And the uncertainty, not knowing if we would be able to survive or not. Whenever rain falls this hard here in Lock Haven, people think back 20 years when 10 inches of rain fell in two days. The Susquehanna River on one side of Lock Haven rose to meet the flooding Bald Eagle Creek from the other. Hurricane Agnes caused $88 million damage here. 
flood damage totaled another 25 million in Jersey Shore and 14 million more in Renova. Everyone in Clinton County who lived through Agnes has a story about her. Back then, Charlie Bauer was 44. I can remember how it destroyed all the buildings in town and how that water was so high that uh, the people had to be rescued from uh, their apartment buildings and, and around the towns and uh, all the destruction that it caused and uh, the aftermath of cleaning up after the flood, which took a lot, uh, lot of uh, people and uh, to get rid of all the debris and all of the uh, thing of the aftermath after it happened. The river crested at 31 and a third feet in Lock Haven. Downtown, this plaque shows you how high the water was, well above my head. Back in 1972, I was 12 years old, and we had many relatives living in Lock Haven. And I remember coming in with my parents to help them clean up. As a matter of fact, I vividly remember walking on this very sidewalk with my father. But it certainly didn't look like this. Back then, the rain had stopped. The water had receded, but there was mud everywhere. It was a sight that was absolutely surreal. And probably the, the worst thing for me, the, what annoyed me the most, was that I couldn't get away from the mud. I just couldn't get away from the smell of the mud. You know, and, and living in it, it was just unbelievable. Ed Johns opened his barber shop in Lock Haven the day before Agnes hit. The floodwaters wiped him out before he ever gave his first haircut. It was just such a, an unbelievable uh, disaster for so many people in, in town. My family had a small delicatessen in town. It was in the flood. We lived in the floodplain. I had my business in the floodplain. Well, coming into town, um, there were broken windows. There was um, rubbish all over the place, garbage. It, it, it looked like a disaster. And um, people were working together, trying to put it back together. Wanted to know if we could afford to get back into business with all the damage that was done and what the um, the prospect of the town would be. No one died, but thousands lost everything, including my grandparents. Someone in a passing motorboat took this picture of their house as the floodwaters began to recede. Notice the wake caused by the boat engine. Those wakes added to the damage. My grandmother remembers a telephone conversation she had with a friend trapped upstairs in her home during the flood. And she said, I got my gun out. And she said, if another boat comes down here and smashes another one of my, my windows, I'm going to shoot them. And she meant it. She meant she would shoot them. She was upstairs. She was trapped upstairs. <laughs> but she said they were just running around sightseeing and really going too fast, you know, in their motorboats. And that's what was breaking. They did a lot of damage by doing this. To prevent damage from another flood such as Agnes, the federal government's now spending $88 million building a dike around Lock Haven. But the project's deeply divided the people here. Despite the protection it will offer, many oppose the levee because it will destroy a beautiful view of the Susquehanna, a river of grace and beauty that 20 years ago changed our lives forever. The floodwaters of Agnes were bad enough. A brown blanket that covered many of the familiar things of our lives, the places we knew. But under that blanket, the water was working, swirling, destroying. We did not know what was going on under there, and so that made it worse, the fear, apprehension. It took a few days for the water to go down, and if you ask most people, that's when the tragedy of Agnes really began. The river had been a vicious thief, destroying, damaging as it stole what we owned. We had waited for the water to go down, thought we might know what we'd find, what to expect. The simple fact of the matter is we didn't. The fact of the matter is we couldn't. The damage was beyond imagination. John Tobias and his wife Mary Lou had a home in Suarezville that was five years old then, they remembered coming back to it when the water went away. We saw that there was no wall in the back of the house. It was all just uh, all caved in, filled with water. The basement was all filled with water. But if that was bad, the inside was worse. We just couldn't believe what we saw. How, how much damage was done and how some of the big things like 
or uh, my wife's piano, it was a spinet laying on its back, which uh, it took four of us to carry to put it into the house. Our dressers, you know, uh, laying down and all tipped over, and a uh, refrigerator laying with the one door wrapped underneath it and all. And over it all, over every place the water had been, there was a coating of slick brown mud that stank of diesel fuel, sewage, and filth. Our oldest boy collected all these little miniature presidents because he loved history. And uh, John went through that mud and found every one of them. And he was crying when he came out. It was just sad. It was very sad. All over Wyoming Valley and beyond the river had stolen really a way of life, the foundations on which we build, the little things. Our wedding pictures, they're all gone. I had slides and things that were from Europe and the acid and the water just ruined them. You can't go back and take pictures of your wedding and, you know, and, and your children and so forth, you know, because that sentimental value items, they're, they're never replaceable. I think that, that kind of hit hard. That, I think that hit very hard. But we did our best. John and Mary Lou and their two sons built a new home on the same site. This one's a, a little higher. Elsewhere, clean up, fix up, rebuild, and we did a pretty good job of it. Still, when it rains too much today, we can't help but think of Agnes, that quirk of weather that kept her here, the tragedy of it all. I wouldn't want to do, I wouldn't want to go through that again. I'm Mike Stevens, News Watch 16, on the Pennsylvania Road. Anthony Cook is one of many people who lived through two floods one in 1936 and again in 1972. The first home in South Wilkesbury, the second on higher ground in the Lee Park area. He believes what many learned from the first experience may have worked against them during the Agnes flood. I really didn't believe that it would get up to the, uh, the height that it did, especially in our neighborhood. I guess everybody was using the yardstick of the 1936 flood as the, as the height of the flood, and no one in our area was prepared for it. As the water was coming up and, and uh, they killed the power in the area, and I figured it was getting serious about that time, and we decided to take some movies. Actually, I tried to um, buy three or four more rolls of film, but the only thing I could buy at the time was two rolls, and, the, and that was the end of it. The pictures tell the story in this community bordering Wilkesbury and Hanover Township. People moving to higher ground block by block until they realize they've lost their homes. To look at the area today, compared to 20 years ago, is almost hard to believe, just as hard as it was back then. But life at that time was difficult, even for those who escaped the flood. There was a run on not only the film, just about everything else in the stores at that particular time. I do remember going to the stores and the shelves would be empty. As the water rose, many families were forced to seek shelter. Now, my family, the whole Garrett clan, ended up here at GAR High School, here with hundreds of other families who were forced to sleep on army cots. But everyone made the best of it. Staring out of the windows of the school, no one knew what awaited them. Anthony Cook called this flood the great equalizer. The rich people and the poor people and uh, the people who were homeowners and also the people renters and everybody else, they were all in it together. And that's why I feel it was a great equalizer. I, it was almost like it was a bad dream because uh, I didn't think that uh, the, the flood was that destructive, but it turned out to be very destructive. Who could imagine something like this could really happen? The damage to home after home, street after street, neighbor after neighbor debating whether to come back. I heard comments, and I do recall many people saying that they were just going to give up and not make any repairs, and other people said no matter what it takes, they were going to come back and make the repairs. In the end, the will of the people won out. The communities are back intact, and the flood, but a vivid memory. No one will ever underestimate the potential might of the Susquehanna again. Jill Garrett, Newswatch 16, Luzerne County. It almost didn't seem real, helicopters landing at the Westside Vocational Technical School on that day in June. An eerie sense of confusion and chaos touching down, 
where there had once been calm. But as military helicopters rescued flood victims from rooftops and brought them here to Westside Votech, plans were already underway inside the school to meet the most basic of needs. When I came in there at 7 o'clock, people were sitting with their, oh, their pillows clasped to their, in, in their night clothing, where they'd been, they just had to get out of their homes. Beatrice Ray is the take charge, five foot two inch dynamo who commandeered all food service out of what was probably the biggest emergency center on the west side. I begged, borrowed, and stole people every which way. Beatrice started calling everyone she knew. She enlisted the help of her family. She tried to find supplies. There were hungry people who needed to eat. I called the dairy and told them I needed milk. So they brought milk in. We had those were refrigerators and freezers over there. We started pulling out. The first day, we served oatmeal, good hot oatmeal and coffee. The number of flood victims who needed help grew. Not only the people who were at the Votech school, but Beatrice estimates a total of 9,000 people were receiving meals from this facility. We set up relays because people couldn't all come here. They couldn't get here. The roads were closed. But we sent out food. The food went out to fire stations all over the west side. Beatrice and her helpers stretched meals, making enough soup and spaghetti to feed a small army. And her dining room supplies, like tablecloths, found new uses. Beatrice remembers the woman who brought in her dog, who died as a result of the flood. So that's where one of my tablecloths went. We wrapped the dog in it, and we, could, we didn't have anything to dig with, so I gave her one of my great big spoons. And she went out on the side hill here and dug a hole and buried that dog in the rain. Now that's the sort of thing that stayed with me. Like so many volunteers, Beatrice's help 20 years ago meant so much more than just putting food on the table. It was the biggest challenge of her career. And thousands of flood victims who probably never heard of Beatrice Ray can be thankful she took on that challenge. Jane Adonisio, Newswatch 16, Pringle. You can look at the pictures a hundred times of Wyoming Valley ravaged, but unless you live through it, you can't really appreciate how the lives of thousands were changed forever. Despair ran real deep. Everything is gone. Oh, God, what are we going to do? Come on, you can it. Oh, what are we going to do? The Wyoming Valley is protected by miles of flood wall. Over the last 20 years, $13 million has been used to repair and strengthen it but the levee is not any higher than it was in 1972. Plus, new homes and businesses have been built, some right alongside the flood wall. We've lived all over the country, and um, everywhere you live, there's something that can happen. There, there's either a hurricane or a tornado or an earthquake. Experts say the Susquehanna River could flood the Wyoming Valley again, meaning more misery and anger, and if there was another flood, it could be much worse than in 72. It's probably going to turn the Wyoming Valley into a ghost town because we're not going to come back and we're not going to have the financial aid from the federal government that we had in the past either. Luzerne County officials have been working with the federal government for 20 years now to raise the flood walls. Do you at all feel uncomfortable working as closely to the situation that we're here 20 years down the road and we still don't have any more protection? Very uncomfortable because, like I said before, you never know when this is going to hit again. Frank Townen was the man in charge of the 1972 evacuation of Wyoming Valley. He's irritated about the delays in raising the flood walls. I have no question about what I think. I think it should have been, should have been completed 15 years ago. And the, well, the government grinds slowly. That's the answer. The improved levee system has a price tag of $200 million, and the construction will be supervised by the Army Corps of Engineers. The Corps defends the 20-year delay in raising the level of protection. There are a lot of studies that we need to go through to make sure that we're designing the best project and that we've uh, taken into account all the factors that need to be taken into account. Construction on the new flood control project is supposed to begin in about two and a half years, but some people wonder if it will be delayed even again. One reason? Luzerne County's share of the project is approximately $25 million. And county officials tell me as of right now, they have no idea where they're going to get that kind of cash. Bob Reynolds, Newswatch 16, Luzerne County. Much of the city of Shimokin is built on the side of a mountain, miles away from the Susquehanna River. 
Shimokin Creek meanders through much of the downtown. It looks harmless enough, the water only a few inches deep. But Morris and Linda Gard of Shimokin remember what happened to this creek in 1972 during Agnes. I, I think it's awesome that you would look at this little creek and know the damage that it could cause and that it did cause. It was scary. It sure was. Take a look at these pictures taken by Morris Gard in the city's downtown. Everywhere you look, water, sometimes walls of water, sweeping away anything in its path. All this from the Shimokin Creek. One of the first places Morris Gard came to take pictures that day was to this junkyard and ranch shop. He was only able to stay here a couple of minutes because, as you're about to see, the water was rising fast. It was, it was just filled with water everywhere. I guess you didn't have to go very far to get pictures, did you? No, no, not very far at all. No, most of my pictures, I, after the, from the junkyard, I came on Shimokin Street and just saw uh, the rescue trucks or fire trucks or firemen. The community of Northumberland sits smack between two branches of the Susquehanna River. The peaceful river turned downright nasty during Hurricane Agnes. Flooded streets, water pushing against homes and businesses, front yards turned into lagoons. John Herman recorded the destruction. 20 years later, he still wonders how bad things might have been if not for a rescue helicopter. They were flying around here. They were, he picked some people off the tops of trailers and things like that, did some rescues that they'd have been in real trouble if he wouldn't have been around. I remember having a, two small children to take care of and wondering where we were going to get food. Sunbury is just across the river from Northumberland. The community experienced its share of damage, but it could have been a lot worse if not for a 12-foot dike built in 1946. But you can see from this newspaper photo just how high the water rose. Take a look at this picture of the Shikalemi Marina in Sunbury. 20 years later, the water looks much more inviting. Agnes did not spare Schuylkill County. Jim Phillips took these pictures of a flooding creek that forged a new path through Middleport. As you can see, getting around was quite an adventure. An adventure a lot of people hope they never have to live through again. Fred Letieri, News Watch 16. I turned around and I looked, all I saw was this wall of water about two, three feet high behind us. And I mean, I never ran so fast in all my life. It was 20 years ago, but Walter Gavlik remembers the Susquehanna River raging through Swoyersville like it was yesterday. As the waters receded, Walter grabbed his home movie camera and started rolling. And when we asked him to show us those movies, the aftermath of Agnes came to life. This was Mike and Nellie Russian. They owned the bar down there. The one that was flooded, mm -hmm. they're washing the dishes and uh, trays, it looked like. After the the water went down, he decided you know, he's going to wash everything and put it back in, but it didn't work out that way. Walter says Russin's bar wasn't the only Swoyersville business that had to start over. What he does, he restores antique cars, and he had some beautiful looking cars in there at the time, and uh, he just had to do it over. This was one of his like cars? One of his cars. He, he left it there, he thought maybe the water wouldn't get up that high, but it did. These are the fire trucks. Uh, there is a, a fire hall down on Slocum Street, so what they did is move the fire engines up on top of the hill. Okay, that's a fire down on Shoemaker Street. It was an apartment and a, a business place. That burned completely down. Okay, this is the playground on Slocum Street now, okay. That, I was taking that shot from up on top of the hill, but the playground survived and they refurbished it. This is the source of a little league field. Some of these signs were there. There's the bleachers, the fence was knocked over, washed over. It was a mess, but uh, they brought it back. But of all the images of Agnes, the one Walter remembers most clearly is the one he wishes he could forget. When the caskets from the 44th Cemetery floated, I wasn't involved. I was just watching the pull, uh, pull the caskets up, and uh, God, that was. That, that's always going to be in my mind. At the time of the flood, Walter's home was high enough that it wasn't damaged. But since then, he's built a new home in the very area that was underwater. People told me, oh, you're crazy building that in a flood area again. I said, hey, I'm more worried about subsidence than the flood. 
There's always the chance that a flood like Agnes could rip through here again. But Walter has faith and says his home will always be in Swoyersville. Mary Ravazio, Newswatch 16, Swoyersville. When the sirens wailed 20 years ago, it signaled the mass evacuation of Wyoming Valley. Frank Townen of Emergency Management knew at 2 a.m., three hours before daylight, that the valley had to be evacuated. But as the floodwaters rose, Townen waited those three hours before giving the order. I was worried from 2 o'clock on until probably around 10 o'clock that it, uh, we wouldn't have quite enough time to get people out. Frank Townen feared a nighttime evacuation would cause mass panic. Not a gamble. We had to balance the danger of panic against the shortness of time. Wyoming Valley was devastated because the river broke through the flood walls in two spots. The walls have since been made stronger, and plans now call for the flood walls to be raised by about five feet. That should protect the metropolitan Wilkes-Barre area. But building the walls higher could mean even higher water in other unprotected areas. By confining the water into the, uh, the mainstream channel, it does uh, increase uh, flooding incrementally in, in some areas. If another Agnes flood strikes and the higher walls are in place in Wyoming Valley, the water still needs some place to go. Federal engineers say the extra water would cause two more feet of flooding in West Nanticoke, a foot and a half more in Makonakwa and Shikshini, and the floodwaters would be a foot deeper in Riverside near Danville and in Bloomsburg. Engineers tell me that the new flood control system for Wyoming Valley will not make the floodwaters any deeper here in West Pittston, but people are still concerned. That's because during the flood of 72, the floodwaters almost reached the bottom of that AAA sign you see over there. Plus, the federal government says it can't justify spending $25 million for a flood wall here in West Pittston or in some of the other unprotected communities. It is right now financially, uh, un it's an uneconomic decision to build levees in those areas. West Pittston officials are trying to convince the government that the value of the property in the borough is well worth the flood control investment. I want to know how in God's name they came up with that 14 to 1 ratio. We have one home alone on Susquehanna Avenue that's up for sale right now. It's $395,000. Other people, including some flood victims, have mixed feelings about building levees in West Pittston. If it would stop a flood, because I would certainly never want to go through this again, I guess I'm for it. However, again, it's going to destroy the beauty of our riverbanks. While people in government debate the pros and cons of flood control, one fact is undisputed. Given the right conditions, the normally quiet Susquehanna River could turn ugly and again turn Wyoming Valley and the lives of thousands upside down. Bob Reynolds, Newswatch 16, Luzerne County. The destruction left behind by Hurricane Agnes is seen here in the home movies shot by Vincent Bambrick of Pottsville. He was employed by PP&L in 1972 and worked to restore power in the Wilkes-Barre area. Like so many people who cleaned up after the flood, I remember being a teenager in 1972. All that summer I worked helping flood victims clean flood mud out of their homes. If you had to clean this stuff, you hoped you'd never have to see it again. And yet, a Wilkes University professor saved several hunks like this for the past 20 years. Wilkes University, one of two downtown colleges, suffered $15 million in flood damage. All 58 buildings on campus were devastated. The closer the buildings were to the river, the worse it was. Dr. Robert Capon, a Wilkes faculty member and one-time president. I'm told the water was going at a very rapid pace when it went through it. It wasn't there long, but it went through at a rapid pace. The water was up about nine rows, nine or ten rows of seats in the Dorothy Dixon Dart Center. Dr. Capon, like other Wilkes faculty, came back to the campus when the flood water receded and started shoveling mud and debris. If certain furniture was salvageable, like metal file cabinets, they, you saw a picture earlier of people hosing out those drawers and hosing out those things to see if they could be salvaged. Some things, like 50,000 volumes from the library, could not be salvaged. The cleanup effort on campus was called Operation Snapback, and within a week, classes resumed. But there was still a lot of work to do. 
For Dr. Capon, that work was on campus and at home. When we arrived back, you could see the mud mark, which shows that the water is five, five feet in the second floor of the house. It was a uh, shock and demoralizing. Uh, and, this, and the cleanup process was not something that you start today and tomorrow morning you're finished. It was a long, drawn-out process. In some cases, it took as long as a year. Fortunately, in Dr. Capon's neighborhood, a group of volunteers from New Jersey showed up and offered to come back on weekends to help fix up houses. They wouldn't even take compensation, saying... We're not here to be compensated. We're here to try to help people get put their lives back together. In the end, people who were flooded out of their businesses and homes, like Dr. Capon, lost a great deal. But many also gained valuable perspective. What you think is important in life is really not important in the end. What's important is surviving, understanding others, understanding that you can live with a lot less material things than you actually need. Nature's lessons are sometimes taught in harsh ways. Jane Adonisio, Newswatch 16, Luzerne County. WNEP-TV 16 invites you and your family to the 1992 For Our Kids Day at Montage Mountain in Music this Sunday. All kids can register to win some awesome prizes donated by our sponsors. Come and meet your favorite Newswatch 16 personalities. Jack Ruland will be there with Skycam 16 and some surprise handouts. Bring the family and take advantage of Montage Mountain's one-day-only special price for a family of four or more to enjoy all the attractions, including Dinosaurs from the Deep, sponsored by the Everhart Museum. So bring the family to For Our Kids Day at Montage Mountain this Sunday. Good evening. This is WNEP TV 16. In order to bring you the clearest reception possible, WNEP operates these additional translators. All of us at Channel 16 wish you a very pleasant good evening. WNEP TV 16. We're proud to serve Northeastern and Central Pennsylvania. Ladies and gentlemen, now the Abington Heights Marching Band.